Alrighty, uh, everyone, today I'm just going to be presenting on a passive seismic survey that we completed at our EVA project in Queensland. There we go. Okay, so just a really quick bit of background. Um, Copper Mountain's a Vancouver headquartered mining development exploration company. So we have the Copper Mountain Mine, which is located a couple of hundred k's east of Vancouver. And um, we also have the, the development and exploration project the, in Queensland, which surrounds sort of the EVA copper project. Uh, we've got a very large land holding of, of exploration ground as well. And most of the tenure is located within the, um, the sort of eastern fold belt of Mount Isa, uh, primarily within the Mary Kathleen domain. Um, and sorry, and so our our copper project, the EVA copper project, which is going to be the development is in the red laces here. And then we've got the exploration ground around it. So just for those of you who are familiar with um, Eastern Isa, so we're sort of located here um, and primarily along this belt of rocks, which is sort of the, the Mont Elbert group. Um, so that series of rocks includes Roseby Shear, Slady Clay, Dolomite, um, Napdale Quartzite, a couple of others. And uh, the reason that we're in this this region is it's incredibly well mineralized uh, for copper and gold. Um, and essentially what you have is a, a belt of, of, of rocks that run uh, north and south and they're margined on the east by the Roseby Fault. There's a whole bunch of, of structures that, that sort of splay off the fault and there's endless mineralization the entire 70 kilometer sort of length. Um, it's a, it's a really wonderful place to work. Now, the vast majority of the belt, um, which is basically all of this sort of area through here, is essentially exposed weathered outcrop of Craterozoic rocks. Um, and then up to the north, though, there's, there's this, this area called the Landsberg Graben, um, and that's essentially a Phanerozoic basin um, with about 200 metres of, of cover. Um, so, yeah. So just quickly, just on the Eva Copper project, which is in the, the northern part of the belt here, uh, we have mineral resources over 310 million tonnes. Um, so there's about 3 billion pounds of contained copper in the ground, uh, gold as well, obviously. Uh, part of our, our recent sort of efforts over the last couple of years have been looking at potentially gold in member uh, sort of IOCGs, um, which might complement our, our many copper in member ones. Um, so there's, we released a feasibility study early this year and we're looking at a 15 year mine life, about 100 million pounds of copper equivalent produced every year. That's gonna come out of a 11.4 million tonne per annum uh, plant. Okay, so the operation's going to have a, um, an 11.4 million tonne plant and um, essentially the, the copper will then go to Mount Isa and Glencore for, for to after the processing. Um, so, Big operation, it's going to need a lot of water um, and we plan on getting that water from dewatering of the pits but also of having a bore field out in the lands for Graben out here to the west. Um, there's also a backup supply of water if we need it if in a pinch which is the Lake Julius pipeline but that's it's a bit more expensive so we're, we're trying to avoid that. So um, the Capitary Creek target is is um, up here to the north and it's it's actually underneath the lands for Graben sediments. Um, all of our Basically, our, our historic exploration pretty much has been uh, along this belt of exposed weathered rocks, uh, which is the Mount Elbert group, which is the Lady Claire Dolomite, Roseby Schist, um, and Napdale Quartzite, and others. Um, so, there's this wonderful uh, ge geophysical anomaly up here to the north, which is is amazing. It's it's a huge chargeability anomaly, a huge conductivity anomaly, um, and also a big magnetic anomaly. It's very, very exciting, especially considering that it's under 200 metres of cover. So, you know, just as some context, this is Little Eva over here, which is our largest uh, copper gold uh, prospect. Um, and it's exposed at surface, it's got about 20 metres of weathering, but then you're into the into the deposit. This is the chargeability response. What it, whatever is down here is is pushing up this huge chargeability response from, from uh, below the, the Phanerozoic cover. Um, so out in the Graben, we, we have essentially 200 metres of cover. You've got about 10 to 40 metres of, of running or soft sediments, um, mostly uh, either, you know, sort of mudstones and um, some sands, some silty sands, conglomerates. Uh, there's also then underneath that um, sort of lithified Cambrian shales, dolomites, calcareous sands. Um, now, for us to go drill 
this area and you know we're going to have to drill pretty deep some of the best historic results are here which was sort of 62 meters of 0.88 copper about 0.2 gold but there's some really nice high grade intercepts amongst that and it it didn't finish in mineralization but i th it finished early because we hit a structure or they hit a structure this was extrata um, so we have to go drill these sort of deep holes sort of you know 500 meters which is extraordinarily deep for us i know a lot of people laugh at that but we normally go and drill sort of 100 meter or 200 meter or maybe 300 meter holes not 500 meter holes so for us to go get the support from the the company to do that we need to de-risk sort of the situation there um, so we had two main reasons to uh, to go and investigate investigate the the structure of the the lands for graben. Um, we pretty much had a, a very poorly understood uh, sort of stratigraphy. Uh, we had really no idea about the structure, faults, and that kind of thing. Um, there's there's a couple of drill holes out there, primarily for water drilling, um, but uh, you know not there's not a lot of great logging and that kind of that kind of jazz. So being able, trying to model and trying to utilize the data we had to then go and, and, and uh, understand the basin was quite difficult. So we, we looked at a bunch of different options um, and we decided to go with uh, what's called uh, passive seismic um, using uh, some devices called Traminos. Um, the reason we, we picked this method was essentially it was really simple to carry out, really simple methodology and incredibly low cost for what you get. Um, and it can be effective for up to hundreds of metres of depth, depending on the conditions. So this is the geophysical sort of method that I will leave you guys to read in another time. Uh, and here is the more simple version. Um, so essentially passive seismic, it's using the ambient uh, seismic vibrations of the earth, which you know might be man-made or just the natural ones. Um, and it, it's collecting uh, uh, I guess, records in X, Y, and Z axis uh, domains. Um, the devices themselves are very small. They're only, you know, sort of, I guess, about uh, 20 centimetres by about 25 centimetres, a little box. You just take them out into the field. You put them in the correct location. You stick a bucket over the top of them to protect them from the wind, and it does its thing for 20 minutes. Um, the, the devices are, are picking up um, sort of shear waves as they're refracted through the different sediments. Um, and they're picking up these signals in the 0.1 to 500 hertz range of frequencies. Um, so at the end of the day, all you do is you download the data off the, off the devices and you email them off to the geophysicist for processing. Um, and then basically the geophysicists work their magic and they, you know, they, they bring, they invert out these, uh, these lovely profiles um, of the, the areas that you've completed. Um, and that's sort of used with our own data, our own drilling and, and mapping to then reconcile what's going on. So uh, this is the area that we decided to do the survey over. So we're up here to the north of the main project area, the levers there. So we're out in this Landsborough Graben, Cabot Tree Creek uh, uh, prospect is here. And we had this interpreted airborne um, EM uh, aquifer. So basically we're able to see this, this conductivity feature, which ended up being, uh, it, it matched up with, with the, uh, what we'd interpreted to be a potential aquifer, went and drilled it and sure enough it was there. And got just a couple of features out through here. So there's, a, there's an existing water bore out here. Um, there's Pinnacle Creek through there and Cabbage Tree Creek through here. So the survey was completed by two of our own staff with less than two hours of training on the devices. Um, we completed the whole survey in 10 days. That consisted of 558 stations. Uh, the, the line spacing was 400 or 100 metre um, over a six by nine K area. Uh, and our spacings were 100 or 50 metre spacings, um, depending on where we wanted to infill. And the really nice thing about this is incredibly low cost. The whole survey, um, excluding our own, our own personnel and, and uh, you know, their overheads was 30K, which is, is pretty great for an area this size. Uh, just a couple of features worth pointing out as well. This is just the, the RTP um, tilt derivative stitch of the magnetics. And that sort of shows these northeast bound structures, which correspond nicely where our target is here, potentially something going on with mineralization associated with these two structures. Uh, so we, we were wondering if maybe there might be 
bolts visible in the basin along that direction. If you look in the, the, the thing imagery, you can sort of see more, you know, with the creeks and that kind of thing, it's, it's more north, northeast sort of trending. So this is the outputs from the, the surveys. This is, this is essentially what you get, which is, okay, so the, these are east-west cross sections, um, just here, as you can see, and you basically get a depth and then um, the, each pixel is, is uh, colored according to the, the amplitude. Um, so the, the lower amplitude features, so the blues, the low, you know, the cooler colors are going to be um, softer sediments and the, the uh, higher ones will be hopefully harder or more dense or at least the uh, faster ones. Uh, just heading south, sort of see this thickening over here, we've got thickening here. Um, just, this is just some examples of what we saw. So if we look at them in a little bit more detail, so this particular section is from this bit here, which crosses our, our interpreted aquifer. Um, and it's also uh, nearby to some drilling that we've got. Um, so some of the features that we sort of started to see immediately we, was there seems to be these nice sharp offsets of the, um, of the top of the, of the, the the, the basement, as they're calling it. Um, and also we were getting these undisrupted uh, sort of features in here in the, in the upper sequence, which a more moderate response rather than the, the low response, which are less disrupted, it seems. And if you do a bit of rough interpretation and comparison, um, basically what, what we were getting was this, this is sort of the extent of where our interpreted aquifer was. Um, and what that are actually correlates really well with is where we've got fault structures and where you have thickening of the, the shallow, um, the shallow sequence. Um, also, we had other thickening over this side that, that we hadn't recognized from anything. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And this is our interpretation. So essentially we've got false op faults with sort of grub and horse style structures going on uh, and if we looked at our drill hole that we had in this locale uh, it was really cool when you look through we actually got calcretes exactly where you had these these particular uh, moderate responses um, and then towards the bottom uh, we hit uh, this shale essentially which ended up being the you know sort of our, our depth to basement in this particular area um, and below that we hit a whole heap of um, uh, fractured rock where we got really, really great, we hit a really great water aquifer in that, that particular zone, which is a fracture aquifer. And I would, I would speculate that that fracture aquifer is actually to do with the faulting that we've interpreted from these, these particular features. Um, cool. And yeah, so this is, this is basically the output from, so this is the, on the left here, is our top of, uh, what we're calling top of Cambrian, which is the top of that, that shale unit. Um, across the area and we had you know uh, these three features sort of come up these three depressions sort of it's higher here so what you what you're seeing here is the blue means there's greater thickness of that overlying soft sediment you know sands gravels um, and, and other bits and pieces uh, there isn't really much correlation between the 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 northeast structures that we saw in the magnetics like maybe you could argue there is i'm not sure it's well here the stippled stuff here is I'm having a great day and my mouse is driving out of battery. Um, so, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, all in all, it was pretty interesting. Like there, there I, I had sort of thought this stippled area might mean that was the deep basement, but who knows really. Uh, what we do know out here where we've got the, the deeper sort of blue, which is the deepest part of the, the model, um, we sub subsequently went and drilled and what we found sure enough was sort of the deepest part of the, the tertiary sediments that we'd encountered so far. So we got down to sort of 46 metres of, of sands and gravels, which are an ideal situation for, for hosting water. And we, we got about two litres per second out of just a, a regular RC hole, uh, rather than, you know, they, they weren't true water test bores. Um, so all in all, I think it was a, a pretty successful uh, little survey. Uh, it, the, the method, the Tremino sort of passive seismic method, I, I think is fantastic for mapping um, your, your soft sediments down to 
to the, the harder or the, the faster sediments beneath. Um, it, it really failed to penetrate into, the, into the, the older sediments. What we were hoping to find potentially was to find a depth to the Proterozoic basement. It wasn't effective for that. Um, supposedly, I, I've seen examples of where it, it works up to 500 metres, but you'd have to have very, fairly specific uh, conditions. And I think it has amazing uh, potential applications in depth to cover, cover star, studies, uh, you know, paleo channel gold, mineral sands, um, kaolinite, those kind of things. So uh, any further information, I recommend you, you talk to Resource Potentials. That's who provided us with the, the devices. And that's it. That was the abridged version. So, cheers.